Welcome, everyone. Sorry about the technical details of getting us started. Um, I can see in our um, in our uh, what is it called list of participants. There's people I know from various different places. Um, so good morning, Salamat Tatang, Nihao, um, Hola, Bonjour, Jumbo. Yeah, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Hella. <laughs> Hella is in a different time zone. Um, a couple of housekeeping things just to get us going here. Um, clearly, we're not going to figure out the video aspect of this, but please make sure your microphone, except for you, Hella, <laughs> that <laughs> keeps your microphones <laughs> muted. Um, you can post something in the chat and we will. Uh, try to look at it and um, you know see if that can inform the things that we would like to say or you know, respond to your questions or comments perhaps. First, um, Helen and I will each say uh, a few words and then we will uh, shift into more of a conversation between the two of us. And I will try to incorporate if you have some comments or questions. Um, yeah. And Hella, maybe maybe you want to mute when you're not talking also. <laughs> I just have to say some Danish. It's good for you. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Hella's son was trying to get us going this morning, and I think, you know, it didn't work out well. But we're here we are. We have audio connection. And we are uh, together across the world, not only uh, California and Denmark, but I know there are people from uh, Malaysia with us today, Indonesia, um, other parts of the US, England, I'm sure of those places. So yeah, mm -hmm. good morning from many places or good evening, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we maybe have everything, morning, yeah. afternoon, evening, yeah. Yeah, for some people it's later at night, like almost midnight. Yeah. So I will begin, and and to begin, I just want to, uh, just want to honor the situation that, that um, the United States is in right now, a very, very troublesome moment in our uh, history, really. The um, our socio-economic political system has not been an even playing field for certain groups of people. You know, some groups in our United States have been mistreated for a very long time, and right now we are in the midst, or maybe the beginning, of an of an uprising of grief and anger at at our system, which treats darker-skinned human beings as less than in so, so many ways. <clears throat> it's kind of hard for me to speak. I'm a little choked up because my heart is breaking for all of those people who have suffered and are still suffering. And I don't, I don't really agree with destruction as a means of change, but I sur surely understand that what's happening is an expression of the fury and frustration from a long time lack of change and a, and a seeming lack of options. So I would like to really begin with just a moment of silence and we could all, all across the world, send some warmth and to love, warmth and love to the people, not only in the United States, but especially in the United States who are really suffering right now. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, yeah, so this year, this year is the 100th year 
of Waldorf education in the world. And who ever thought it would be like this? The first Waldorf school started at the end of the Spanish flu epidemic. And it's 100 years later. And I don't even need to say. And we can't even end this 100th year with the children. And it's, it's so nothing that we could have expected. And right now, right now is the time when we all, at least in the US, and I know other places, would be ending their school years. Right now is the time for ending a school year. And yet, we haven't been together with each other and with the children for, for some months. So I keep asking, is there something that we're supposed to learn from this? You know, is it possible to reframe this, this situation into a, an opportunity for us to learn something? Maybe we could see this situation as a call to redefine what we're doing and to, to make sure what we're doing is deeply rooted in our values. You know, our education, it's based on some, some very powerful ideas about human development and about spiritual practice that comes from uh, Rudolf Steiner. And Dr. Steiner offered us really powerful thoughts about the realm of human freedom. Well, we on the grandest scale imaginable have the opportunity to practice some of the things that Dr. Steiner offered. The only place that we have freedom, real freedom, is in deciding how we could respond to the things that happen, we, how we can respond to what comes towards us. We don't have the possibility to control events, even though <laughs> we wish we could, and even we think we could. We try to control our events around us, but we can't. The only freedom we have is in deciding how we respond to what's coming towards us. Now, as we think about the situations moving forward of opening schools again, or schools have been open the whole time, but uh, allowing students and teachers to be present on the same location, there will be regulations coming from various governmental organizations that, that tell us certain things that we're gonna have to do. There's gonna be practical, details that we will have to um, take up, no matter what we think about the situation. The regulations are going to bind us to certain courses of action. And that's fine, our intellect can deal with it. That's what the intellect is supposed to do. That's what the intellect can do. I don't want us today at all, really, to focus on the practical details. I want us to remember the spiritual source of our approach to caring for the young children and their families. Our Waldorf education was founded out of a spiritual path, an inner path, anthroposophy. And I'm not saying that we should all become hermits and sadhus and, and sit in our little homes and meditate all the time. But there is refuge in the inner path. And it... it it renews us so that when we go out into the world to face the practical details that we're gonna to have to deal with, to deal with the things that we don't yet know, it, it really can strengthen us and enrich our imaginations. Many of you knew Margaret Meyercourt who passed away earlier this year. She was one of the elders in our Waldorf early childhood movement. And she often said, I'm sure, Many of you have heard her say this, had heard her say this, what right do I have to stand before the children unless I am developing myself? It's so easy for us to get lost in worrying about the details, but we have to remember the essential core of our work as early childhood professionals in the Steiner educational stream, in Waldorf education. It is the work on ourselves. One thing is for sure, we are, we are in a deep sea of uncertainty right now. You could wonder, will you have a job? Will your school continue to exist? Will your friends or family get the virus? What are the actual facts about the virus? What about the children? Will the children actually come to us? What will the families think about going to a school? What will the regulations be? 
so much is unknown. The other day I was talking to my uncle and he said, I had to write it down, it was beautiful. Uh, I'll name him Richard Whitehill, my uncle said this, the most important attribute right now is an enormous tolerance for uncertainty. Surely, when we receive clarity about the regulations from the various agencies, our intellect will manage the solutions. That's what it knows how to do. But right now, living into the questions is more important, I think, than finding answers, because the answers are going to come from outside of us. But the question can live inside of us. If we can allow the questions to live within us, then different possibilities can arise if we can be open and accept the uncertainty, the unknown. You know, it's a really tough question. Can you embrace the unknown? So there's two little pieces I just want to offer. One is the, the, the question of managing the uncertainty itself. There's many tools, many practices that we could find that help us to center and calm and, and, and really let go of this need to know that we all have. How, how do we do that? Because what happens if, we, if, if our intellect is really struggling, struggling to, to figure it out and to then know what it is, but it's not able to do that, but stuff happens in a physiological way in our bodies our whole nervous system shifts away from this sort of relaxation place that they call rest and digest. And it, it shifts us into this fight, flight, or freeze mode, which means we're not able to, to be calm, which means our vagus nerve is stimulated, which means we're not able to really be present. So first and foremost, we have to find ways to calm down our nervous system and to accept the uncertainty that just is right now. And the other thing that I keep thinking about is the whole point of being a human being, which is that we have to figure out how to connect. You know, when we're born, when we're little babies, all we do is connect with all of our experience. We, ju we just connect. But as the intellect develops, as various aspects of being human develop, it becomes not such a given that we can connect. So as an adult, we have to, we have to learn how do we bring more connection? How do we bring more connection into our lives with nature, with ourselves, with others, with the spiritual world? And again, I, I go back to thinking about Steiner because now we are very disconnected. We're physically disconnected. Be you know, even before earlier this year when everybody had to stay in their homes and everything, we already were disconnected. We, we haven't uh, cultivated connection as a, as a social cultural norm. So it has to do with, with the heart. It has to do with opening our hearts so that we can find the love and compassion that's inside us and that we can share it. We can do our deeds in the world out of this love and compassion that, that is in us. You know, what blocks us from doing that stuff? Fear, of course, worry about what's unknown. But we have to figure out how to connect with that deep well of, of love and compassion. And that really, I think that is the, is the core of the message of Rudolf Steiner, of anthroposophy, is that we have to learn how to receive the wisdom and act on the wisdom out of love. And then when, when we open our hearts and, and, and pour out into the world our deeds of love, then connection, it just is. So I think maybe I rambled a little longer than I meant to. And now, uh, Hella, I'm going to mute myself. Maybe everyone wanted to mute me a little bit earlier, but now, Hella, I would like to hear what you have to say. Well, is there anything left? <laughs> no, thank you, Steve. Um, I think 
I would like to to do some thoughts with all of you. I, I mean, I'm Danish, so my English will be Danish English. And for me, it's 5.30 in the afternoon. The sun is so strong. We have the first summer day in Denmark. And it's incredible warm. I think it's maybe 23 degrees, which for Dane is very warm. I want to start with my meeting with the Corona, which was, I think Corona has made huge problems, but it has also given the possibility of a lot of positive things that maybe we should go into what can we get out of a moment where the whole world stops. I mean, of course, it's horrible for those who are ill and they died of it. And, and that's never a good thing. But this, that the world suddenly are connected in a thing where, in a thing where there is an awareness, where we have a possibility of all of us stopping, thinking, asking ourselves, how is my life? What do I want with my life? Can I do any changes? I I was in South America, in first in Ecuador and then in Colombia, and I had to get out of Colombia to go come back to Denmark, and it was very interesting. In just three days, every day, every hour, the circumstances of getting home became more and more difficult and also very confused. And I think many, many people around the world has been in a situation where they need to go home. They're told to go home, but you cannot get home. And what does it mean not to be able to go home? You have to consider what does it mean to have a home? Why is it important for me to go home? And suddenly, maybe it means a lot to be at home, not only, I mean, I'd rather be in Denmark with the hospital than in Colombia with the hospital there, but also I wanted to be with my family, even though I could have stayed very nice places in Colombia. My family was really asking me, come home, please come home. So suddenly, this to realize that family meant a lot. It meant a lot that if I was going to die, I was going to die within my the, the, the neighborhood of my family. So a lot of dramatical things, but I got home with the last flight that was allowed to leave Colombia. And it, it was at the same time in this coming Easter time. I mean, mostly as a kindergarten teacher, we all know that the time before Easter is a difficult time. The, the spiritual uh, sacrifice that Christ is going to give, you can feel it. And the children are tired and they are exhausted and they are much more clinging and crying. And then you have Easter, and after Easter, normally, now you start working. It's much more easier to be with the children because there has been like a resurrection, uh, uh, a positive uh, way. And now, today, it is Pentecost. It is where we speak in many languages. It's a, it's a day where we blow balloons just to see how the, the, the resurrection uh, into the spiritual world is happening. And, and I think that is also a very big um, 
interesting thing about Corona, it came before Easter and it's nearly leaving now after Pentecost. For me, that has been an interesting aspect. In Denmark, we haven't had a very severe situation because both we're only 5 million people, but also it was closed, the Danish society was closed down very fast. And people were sent home to stay home. And it was incredible what happened in many places was actually that the children, they loved to be home. Denmark is different in that aspect that since the 60s, everybody from they are, in, you know, very early they are an institution. The Danish people don't put a question whether to do, to be in an institution from six, eight, ten hours because we are workaholics. And this suddenly you had, mom and dad had to stay home with the children and it was not holiday. It was out of holiday season. Uh, there has come a lot of good things out of it, especially for the children. Many of the children, they just love to be home. And they were home so long that they start longing to go to kindergartens. The school children were longing to go to the school. They were longing to meet their friends. They were longing to learn something instead of being online. And I think that has been a very important uh, awareness that we need, or we, we need because we wish the social life. The children were longing and wished to go to the kindergarten. They were longing and wished to go to the schools. So everything started up some weeks ago. And of course, because of the fear of Corona, the circumstances changed. The, the government added more people to the kindergarten and to the school. You had to be less children in groups of five in the kindergartens to a teacher and no more than 10 children in a classroom in the school. And suddenly children were feeling so much better. They were running into the, the, the state kindergartens, running into the schools, and they were uh, learning much more and coming home in much better mood. And here lately, uh, there is a report from women giving birth. Because there is a shutdown on the hospital of visitors, they have 90% less early birth than before. And there's nearly no problem with learning how to breastfeed. Nearly no problem with uh, depression after birth because all the stress and all these many people and many social connection has been cut down. And this is something that they have taken very serious at the hospitals. Also, there's less infections. There is less illnesses uh, connected to air pollution and so on. And at least in Denmark now, the government has really uh, taken it very se seriously about turning more uh, green awareness into everything. So for me, Corona has been hard, but it has also given a chance to say, we don't want to go back to normal. We want to change normal because normal was not healthy. So for me, uh, uh, Sitting, watching the, the children, I live in the first floor and the kindergarten has been working now a month. Looking at the children coming uh, and spending much more time outside, even though this is an outdoor kindergarten, and being so happy to be in the kindergarten and the parents so happy to have a kindergarten 
so they uh, they can have some time where they are not with their children but can meet the children afterwards uh, because they have uh, less working hours and kindergartens have less opening hours has been an awakening in the Danish society. You can come on, Steve, now. Okay. Could you hear me? I hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I heard uh, one thing that you said when you were um, trying to get to home. You had a, a wish and your family had a wish for you to be home. And in case you were to, to die from the virus, you wanted to do it at home. Yeah. I, I'm just thinking that, you know, probably some of us, I certainly know someone who passed away and he, he wasn't at home. And his wife was at home, but he was not at home. And it, it's really a, a hard a hard situation to have a loved one so ill or passing away and you're not able to be there. Yeah. Also, all the elderly people who have not had so much, haven't been allowed to have visitors. I actually had a very old friend, 93 years old, and the last phone call I had with her is, she said, I'm going to die because I have no social life. I cannot live without that. I don't do die from Corona. I die from not having a social life. Three days later, she died. Yeah, that's so sad. It's so it's so obvious how important the the social connection, yeah. but the but the in person social connection, talking on the phone or like this or you know, it's a it's a technological miracle that here we are, thousands and thousands of miles apart, and we are having a conversation, but. It doesn't provide all of what we need. No, and maybe we are, I mean, so many schools are doing internet teaching now. And, and it's not the same. And my hope could be that young people actually get so fed off this internet teaching that they realize that it cannot fill out their life, that they go back to the need of social life. This could be a positive benefit. I, I, I'm hoping so. In, here in Denmark, it was uh, the first four weeks they could have the, the students to go on internet in the, in the school system. But after the first four or five weeks, they didn't come on anymore because they didn't want to sit just with an internet. They want people. They wanted friends. They wanted the teachers to tell them off or to, to look them in their eyes and tell when they were good and bad. Yeah. Very interesting. Yep. So you, uh, one thing you said th that you think that the virus is leaving now. I, I hope you're right. But that, that's not everyone thinks that, though. Well, why shouldn't it? It has, done, it has done its purpose. It has awakened us. But of course, if we don't awake, it will come back. Right. So, so they've reopened schools in, in Denmark. Are, are... All schools are open. All gymnasium, all high school. Are all, yeah. And they're open sort of just in the same fashion that they were open before, like full classes and no no what they call personal protective equipment we're danes uh, so yeah there <laughs> is they have to sit with a with a meter between uh, in the school and they have to wash hands when they come to the school and they have to wash more hands and uh yeah they and they they use the gym gymnasium now to sit and for the bigger classes because they are bigger and yeah. But the kindergarten and nursery is totally back to normal. You sit with a child on your lap again and and you tell story. You can tell story inside. Well, here they choose to tell story outside just to because they can and it's easy. 
for and they wash the in kindergarten nursery and kindergarten nursery has never been any difference but kindergarten they are washing more hands but uh -huh. but that's it so in, we all know this idea that, that's so important that the young children need the experience that the world is a safe place, the world is a good place, and yet there's so many people worrying about, worrying about is the world a good and safe place, or what if I wear a mask, then I will make the world not a good place for the child, and so on. What do you think about that, or what do you think that the carers of the young children, the 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 adults in the kindergartens and early childhood settings, what are they going to do to to provide that feeling of safety, even if, you know, there's rules that they have to go along with, such as masks or whatever? Of course, if, if there's rules, you have to follow the rules. I mean, uh, even though they are stupid rules, but maybe, I mean, how can you eat with a mask? I mean, <laughs> you have to take it off when you eat, I suppose. Uh, um, and you have still have your eyes to speak with, but but I think the the question higher than the mask is what is the most important thing for a for for a young child, and I, I think it is to have a, a rhythmical daily life that where yesterday, today, and tomorrow is the same. And so many children of today feel so safe and comfortable in the kindergarten. So I think it is important for the children to be in their known uh, uh, atmosphere. So by all means, if you need to have the, the rules is a mask and I guess you are checked. But I, you don't have need to have a mask outside, do you? I mean, that would be silly. Yeah. Uh, but then if you don't have to have it outside, well, why don't you stay outside? Of course, on the northern hemisphere, we have summer now. It's not a problem. In the southern hemisphere, they, they're going towards winter. But But it's also a question about, you know, can we change something? And, and if we can... It can be more outside because we don't need masks. I mean, it's the fear is not the mask. The, the 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 problem is what what do I put into a mask? A mask is just a mask. But if if you cannot carry it with with you know, well, this is what it is for a month or two. Um, like right, I have to have an what, apron on, or I have to have socks on in winter. Or, I think if you if your attitude towards it is well it's just a precaution that's how it is and it will go away i think you can you can live with that if you have to yeah so do, do you have a suggestion for people who are you know that's not just oh yes it's a precaution and it's a rule so i must do it but people who are who are very fearful like what would you advise that those people but Who what are you afraid of? <laughs> well, they're afraid. Many people are afraid of the disease itself. Okay, I've never been afraid of that. But yeah, yeah, we are different, and of course, the. You, I mean, there can be reason to be fearful if you are very ill or very old, or you have an yeah. immune system that is, is low. But I mean. Children, they don't get very ill from from uh, Corona. Mostly. Young people don't. Yeah, of course, but it's the same. I mean, you can from normally you don't from influenza, you don't get very ill, but some get very ill. I mean, 80, 90 percent don't get very ill. Of course, it's the teacher can be very ill and can be uh, more ill than than a child can be maybe. So it's how can you be protect yourself as an as a as an adult? And I think there's a place where Steiner actually say if you go to bed with fear in the night, 
your immune system will get more easy damage than if you go to bed at night with uh, a confidence in tomorrow is good and I can manage. Yeah. So, so what, but I think, I think you have to ask you, but America is very afraid. But one of my questions, we, we talked about, we were going to put each other questions. And one of my questions to you is actually, you talked a little about it in your, your, the little talk you had in the beginning, but for you, what is the difference between fear and, uh, afraid in, in Danish there's a, a very big difference to be fearful and to be be afraid do you have yeah. that you're, you're, no not in English maybe I think what you mean is the difference between fear and caution yeah caution is maybe that's more instinct no caution is being is it's being, a culture yeah, made. taking precautions fear is it's it becomes something in your physiology because you you know your extremities get cold and you 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 tighten up and you don't you know you're waiting for something bad to happen mm -hmm. caution means you you're in maybe in a more calmer state of um of being and you look at the situation and go okay yes how can i minimize risk that's yeah. that is that what you mean well sort of yeah you know Can there's you... also there if, you know if you think about fear it's a whole spectrum of things fear is maybe the the most extreme end of it and then a, a little less than that is somewhere in there is worry and anxiety and some people just have you know, just live as being an anxious person, not even specific things might happen, but something might happen. Then, and so it's a, it's a whole spectrum of, of people's experience. And, you know, some people, I've heard people talking about, basically it sounds to me like fear of wearing a mask, not the fear of the disease even, but fear of if I wear the mask, I will be damaging the children around me. Oh, they're so strong. They're survivors. I think we have to we we have to differentiate, you know, what is my fear and what is a real fear for a child. I mean, child, they are. I mean, the most children already from kindergarten and home is such a big difference that you often think, why don't they become schizophrenic? So, in in many ways, we really have to to differentiate. What is, what is really a problem for children and what is a problem for the adults? And the, the children imitate the adults. So in a way that it's very important to talk about fear within the adult. For me, yeah. that is the, the fear that is made cult, cultural, you know, in your culture. Yeah. They tell you to be all this. And then there is the instinct you, you mentioned, you know, run or fight. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think also what you're saying, children are very adaptable. Think about the child. They don't want to wear clothes. You know, I mean, at least in where it's warm, they don't want to wear clothes at all. And yet the culturally, mostly culturally, they get used to wearing clothes in certain countries. I mean, you've been to to countries in Asia where lots of people wear masks, not because there was a extra virus going around just because it's a cultural thing that people wear masks. If they're ill, they wear a mask. If they were, if the air is bad, they wear a mask. It's just a thing that people do and people get used to those things. It's not like a terrible thing. It's only a terrible thing if you carry this idea, this is a terrible thing. Yeah, but you can, but then, but that's another discussion, you know, why, why do they have to carry these masks all the time? Because why are they have the, do they have so much fear all the time for getting dirty and uh, virus and bacteria and all that? I mean, I come from Denmark. We say 
you have to get seven pounds of dirt, eat that for a child every year to become healthy. So it, it's also, of course, it's it different things to to have in your culture. What what is good and what is not good? Yeah. Well, our what culture, you, the United States culture, today, May thirty first, two thousand and twenty is a very, very divided culture, more than I could have even imagined, whether it's, you know, how people think about this virus or this pretend virus, or you call it whatever you want. The, the, no, it is a virus, yeah. yeah. I, I understand, but there's still <laughs> division about that. And oddly, somehow, in the whole world population, there's... 5% or approximately of the world population lives in the United States, but approximately 30% of the recorded cases of this virus are in the United States. It's just like, it's just a strange thing. Not to mention people's divisions about so many other situations. I mentioned one earlier. You know, it's, this is a mm -hmm. time, a hopeful time of change. Yeah, but, let's come back to fear. Yeah. The, let's come back to what, how, how do you see this fear in the adults? How can we overcome our fear and still be, um, uh, uh, what do you say? You still have to be very uh, precaution of washing hands and keeping this. I mean, have use common sense. I know there's not a lot of common sense anymore, but but this to be able to have common sense and yeah that's and the then, thing it, and it's, then work with your fear yeah it's your called own fear. it's called common sense but there's no such thing at all anymore there's sense but it's not common but yeah you have to find ways to work with your fear and you know what i i know you you're not a very fearful person nor am i but if so, if one of your uh, assistants or students said, you know, I feel I realize I'm a fearful person, what would you advise them to do? To to how would you advise them to work with that fear? Well, it wouldn't be just to Corona. It would be then yeah. to life itself. Huh? It, uh, yeah, but I, you have to turn it around. And how do I work with trust? Yes. How do I work with trust? How how do I start trusting myself more that I am capable of overcoming? Or, or uh, experience my success instead of my uh, what what do you call the opposite of success? Failure. Yeah, and when it's not so dramatic as failure, but not successes, but uh, yeah, falling short of your goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, one thing for me, and I, I like I say, I think by nature I'm not a fearful person. But what still strengthens me is doing some of those meditations that Steiner. Um, offered to us do you know mm -hmm. what the main exercise is for me that's that's sort of like my almost my daily medicine is this is what steiner called the main exercise and the six exercise no not that the main exercise which it, the the words start out in purest outpoured light oh, okay yeah. uh, you know that mm -hmm. one and mm -hmm. the, uh, for me the idea is is really learning how to listen to the to the wisdom that's coming from the cosmos from the stars and the planets and really like allowing that into me and it in in itself that's already a calming activity and then the 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 inverse part of that the 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 uh, the activity that it calls on me to do is to to do things in the world based on love based on you know serving the needs of other people and like kind of really entering into that interaction 
between the cosmos and myself and other human beings. That to me is, is it allows a, a space of, you know, of trusting the, that, that wisdom that's coming from the cosmos and then trusting myself to, to be serving the needs of others. Mm -hmm. No, that's what I think is, at least that's how I see the core of my, my uh, being in the world. It's trying to listen to the wisdom coming towards me, wherever it's coming from, and then hoping that that informs my deeds. Not really hoping, letting that inform my deeds so that the re one side effect of that is it it has a calming it has a, a you know a, a grounding effect on me and I, I often suggest that for other people because uh, you know the most important thing is the work we do on ourselves before you can be with other people and before you can be with children being with yourself is kind of important yeah, or it, it has to work side by side, I and mean, else we will be 80 or 90 or our first next next incarnation before we could be with children. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, it takes I know, a long time. Um, I, I, I just want to add that part of the situation we're in is that parents, some parents are fearful of having their children go back into a social environment because of the parents' fears of diseases. Yeah. So we they, again, I feel like we have to show them our groundedness, our being balanced and calm as we, you know, as we look forward with the parents, let them know what it's going to be like. And yes, there's no such thing. There is no such a thing as zero risk. You know, that we we I think we've all wanted to to pretend that we can create ultimately completely safe situations whether it's about the virus or you know children hitting each other or whatever it is we only can create situations where we make it as safe as we can but it's never going to be a hundred percent there's no such thing but we fool ourselves. It's what I was saying before. We think that we can control the environment to such a high degree that it is ultimately safe. So we have to reconnect to this, the, like you said, the confidence that we are good enough to create the best situations that we can. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think for, for me, I'm a very practical person, and these the six exercises that Steiner gave has been the most used on, uh, that I have used in my life. And I've just been finishing a book uh, for one and two years old where the first chapter is, is about the, these exercises because, as you said, if you do, if you don't work on yourself, if you don't trust yourself, if you, if you don't get confidence in yourself how can you work with the children and have them to let go of fear but get into trust and also have the parents to trust that that you are capable to do what you are saying it's not just wind it is it's not just words and this exercise about positive thinking for me it has been for the last 30 years, I'm doing positive thinking in everything in my my daily life. I really try to find the positive in all the problems that you meet every day. And if for me, it's it's now just a reflex that that I instead of thinking, oh, Corona. <gasps> what do I do is more okay how can I how can I use it so I get the best out of corona so that I learn from it and and 
that I can see all these good things that is ha happening because of that. And and that's also, it's a very important thing to work around your fear is to see the positive things and then also objective observation. Because if you if you start giving time for people to for you to listen to them and to allow them to be who you who they are but not take over and and have time to observe people maybe this fear that many parents or, or teachers are sharing with you is about something completely different than what it sounds like and then you get into inner education of yourself. Yeah. Uh, just helping, listening, so the person can hear themselves. Yeah, I cannot, yeah, I cannot tell anybody how to behave, huh? Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I, I also work with those six basic exercises, and they're so helpful. And even especially in our time of in in this country of such division of of thinking, that you can try to be open-minded and consider well, what if what this this parent is fearful of? I need to be really instead of judging them right off the bat, I need to to hear them to to try to live into their perspective. You know that's part of what open-mindedness is. Well, what if my what if my idea isn't isn't the right idea, isn't the correct idea? So try to really meet the people that you meet with that attitude. And I, I so appreciate what you said about the positivity because it isn't so much. Oh yeah, I'm just gonna put a smile on my face and pretend everything is good. That's no, not no positivity. no no. It's I think of it as as in if there are challenging situations <laughs> there will be and when there are challenging situations that you you have the attitude of what can I learn from this situation yeah, yeah. so yeah I, I really appreciate that you said that and I, I just before we're done I, I really would like you to 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 tell everyone a little bit about this book about for one and two year olds that you're working on. Yeah, uh, before I do that, I would I would like really to appreciate uh, what Corona brought was also that an outdoor life is really important. With outdoor life, there's so less illnesses passed on to each other. And uh, working outdoor all my life and working with these children being outside, I think it's something that nature really tried to pass on to us, that nature by itself has a healing effect. And being outside, playing outside, climbing outside, uh, that is more space than when you are inside. Inside is also important, but this that children are allowed to be outside in all weathers, being well dressed, is, <laughs> is something that I find is so important. Uh, also for the world of movement, I think it's really catching on, but really to understand going for walks and going for uh, playing in the garden while you're doing garden work or you're doing housekeeping work outside is something we can really learn from corona that it is okay to do that and the children will benefit from it yeah just in case anybody who's listening doesn't know this hella <laughs> for 30 years or 30 more 30 years ago about started a program in Copenhagen which is a, a northern northern part of this world where winter is a lot of snow and a long time and her program had the children outdoors all day long one-year-olds until they were 
uh, six-year-olds and getting ready to go into class one. So she has a, a lot of experience with with being outdoors and is a is a uh, promoter of outdoor uh, early childhood experience for so many reasons. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I will say we are not only outside, but we are mostly outside. Uh, we are, I really appreciate being inside. So the children eat inside and sit on potty inside, but they also sleep outside, the one and two years old. And the, the, the three to six years old, they have a um, three quarter of an hour playing inside and, and cleaning up and, and do the cooking. So the reason why we are so much outside is because children are inside when they are home. It, that was not like that when I was young. We were outside all the time. Yeah. But modern life is that people are inside and children need to be outside. And I think actually that Corona has really made this very clear. Less illnesses, more happy children, uh, and etc. So, yeah. yeah, I think this is an important learning. And also it's important this washing hands and cleaning our kindergarten. We have people from outside coming cleaning our kindergartens now. Why don't we do it? Why is that not an artistic work in our kindergarten that we clean? And also washing hands. It's, it's Of course, it's very important to wash hands. And in some culture, Asia, they, they are living, they are very, very clean about themselves and in their home. And it's nearly too much. Where we often in the in the in the Europe, it's not as clean. I mean, we can really learn more about cleaning hands and cleaning houses again. And uh, yeah. so I think there's there's a lot of sense coming back to us with Corona. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, we I know we could talk about some of this for a long time, like this idea that. Since if we're outside, then some of the, the things that people have come to think of as you must do in Waldorf kindergarten kind of a program, like all those cute crafts and everything, and that you only make them on Tuesdays every week and such like that, like those are the kinds of things we have to ask questions about. Even yeah, we can, we can do it when we have cooked and when we have cleaned and when we have done all the the things that the, to become a human being, we have to learn. Then art is, of course, a wonderful thing. But if you cannot cut with a knife, what does it help you can paint with a pencil? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what use does that do? Exactly. So I, I think we should do this again sometime. But I really want to give you a chance to tell everyone about your new book. <laughs> it's just, I mean, my layout woman, she's crazy on me because I'm having this talk because she wanted me to sit and, and be sure that the right pictures for the book is pointed out. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing from caretaking of children under tree out of outside home uh, because I see on my travels around the world, which I've done the last seven years, there is still a huge problem. How do we actually take care of little children? Because the little children are not little kindergarten children. And to come back to simplicity is so difficult because many things, we just do what they do in the kindergarten with the little ones. And uh, there's often too many little ones together and very few adults as well. And, and little children, they need so much time plenty of time and they hate to do transitions so you have when you work with little children to work a lot on making a simple day where it is coming going for a walk coming home eat sleep and go home that's actually in six eight hours is what you should do and not a lot more but if you do that you need to know really deep how you do the things and more important, why do you do the things? Why is it important? How do we sit at a table? Do we sit on a high chair or a low chair? How is the gesture of the adults? And uh, Because with little children, it's so much who the adults are. It's 
it's much more important that the, the caretakers, the gardeners of the little children really are able to overcome their own uh, delights and wishes because whatever we do, we do it because we can see it's a need of the child. And for that, you have to really um, work a lot on yourself. You have to talk less. Very difficult in the most co cultures. The teachers are talking a lot all the time. But of course, you also need to talk. But what do you say? It has a meaning. How do you say it? Do you speak in sentences? How do you relate to a child? Uh, and so on. So all these little things I've tried to make very clear uh, in the book. And I have also used, uh, not used, many people around the world is having voices in the book telling how they do home daycare or mo mother and uh, parents and teachers uh, uh, club. Group. Yeah, yeah, we don't do that in Denmark, but you do it in many places in the world. And uh, the coming parents, what, what what thoughts do they do to have a child? And and a te the care setting, what is the concern about the little child? Because I think our society are not really concerned about the need of the little child. They are not really concerned about giving families time to be with little children. And so this is this is a book, book where I advocate for the little child out of my experience uh, for 30 years. And it's coming out now in two weeks in Danish. And then we will start doing uh, the English and Spanish translation. And uh, there's many, like Taiwan wants to to translate it and probably also China and many wants to translate it in different languages because there is not so much practical knowledge about how, why and how do you do things. Many things about little children is very theoretically and maybe done by people who have not worked with little children. <laughs> yes. And here it is hands on. How do you change a diaper? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I would love to do this type of conversation with you and maybe for the sake of others, but maybe a, a future time we could speak more about, you know, more philosophical thoughts about what are we doing with the young children? Because one thing you said, I think, is one of the most important things that we could do, which is to really have reasons for the things that we are doing, you know, really have yes experiences but also if someone says hey why are you having the six-year-olds help change the diapers you know that you have reasons for the things that you choose to create in your uh, in the program that you're offering for young children it's so important that it isn't because well they, in my training they said to do this or that but that people really use the the possibility of of really understanding the the choices they have and then making a choice to really best serve the children out of themselves digesting the possibilities so yeah i, I would love to continue this in 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 our future times i know you're busy and i am busy and yet we could probably figure out how to do this from wherever we happen to be oh sure yeah. But it could also be nice for to hear the voices of people. What have they got out of this? And do they have any questions? Can we do we know? Can we do that? Or how do we do this? We can do that. It, it, let's give it a try. If someone would like to um, say if this was a valuable experience, or if you have a, a burning question, you can. I think you can unmute yourself. So let's see what happens if, if people who are listening try that. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, yes I, I could can. unmute. Okay, and then you have something to say.
Hi, I'm Pavitra here from the Waldorf School of Peninsula in Los Altos, uh, California. Uh, so many gifts I get um, from this talk today. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I keep telling my colleagues how uh, fearful I am and how I how hard it is to work towards being unfearful almost every single day. Um, and this is just um, a grand opening for me that you both gave me. Um, yes, so thank you so much. I do have a question about uh, being, I mean, going out for walks when it comes to encouraging parents. Um, some families live in a very, um, you know, in areas where there is a lot of um, maybe vehicles come, uh, passing by or there is not much nature. Can you talk about how uh, it can impact children um, or does it impact children when you walk around in such areas where there's too much traffic and things like that? Well, do you talk about parents or do you talk about kindergarten? Uh, when it comes to encouraging families to walk outside. Well, I, I mean, you live in a place where everybody have one or tw two cars. And mostly yes. you can, you, yeah, you can maybe go 15 minutes. And often, I have seen that people say, well, there's no green areas around. But then when I have gone for a walk or taking a car in the area, I find green places. So it's also a question about, do you see the green places? I'm not talking about 45 hectare of forest. A, a child, if there is five bushes, they feel they are in the jungle. So it's also, I mean, we, we don't need huge places. It could be nice, but... But uh, the mostly you can actually find something green where you are. I think also if if you live in a very urban setting where where you as the adult thinks there's not much green around you, well, first of all, you have to show your child the example that you do take walks anyway. And then if you do take a walk with your child, they will show you where the green is that you didn't even see. Yeah, but, but I have been like in Beijing or, you know, many places where, or Mexico City, uh, where it is can be dangerous and it can be difficult to go out or in India where there can be a lot of snakes. Or, so, of course, you have to take precautions, but but you can find ways, but you have to think out of the box and maybe it... You have to take the car 15 minutes to get out or, uh, but you, the then you do it in the weekend or if you are home with your car, with your child, well, every morning you go somewhere after uh, all this traffic jam in the morning, maybe 9.30 is a good time to leave between 9.30 and 11. That's where there's not so much traffic. I mean, it all depends on, well, do you see your possibilities? And and what also you ask yourself, what is it I want to get out of it? Is it the nature or is it the walk and the mus muscle, uh, muscles building up and the cross movement and the brain bridge, uh, bridge uh, building? I mean, you have to know why do I want to do this? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for for asking. Mm. Steve, what's happening? I'm here. I, I think that no one else would like to speak. Maybe. I don't know. Um, well, I would like to uh, thank you, Hella, for, for doing this with me. I mean, we've had a few fun conversations over the past couple of weeks, and continues it continues today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so 
until we do this again, which I hope we will, um, thank you and uh, is, is, is hey the goodbye in um, Danish or is that not right? Hey Doyle, it's Swedish, hey. but it's nearly oh, the same. You... Danish oh. is much shorter, we just say hi. Hi. Do you want to... Can I tell a joke? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's from a Chilean who is living here in Denmark, a friend of me. Yeah, it was in Corona, we had to, to, to be two meters away from each other. And then now it's gone down to one meter. And it's getting, you know, normal, you don't need to do it. And, and she told me, well, okay, the two meters, the one meters is, is allowed now. So we go back to the Typical Danish, five meters apart. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's why we have so little Corona. Maybe. We take our space. <laughs> yeah, because you there you have the space there, so you take it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hella, thank you so much. This was fun and interesting, and um, we will talk again. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, bye-bye.